Hey everybody, Suzanne Dunn. I'm the English coordinator for grades 6 through 12. And we thought it'd be a great idea to try to record some read alouds for your enjoyment. Uh, I used to teach middle school for 13 years, so I have some real favorites and I was hoping to share them with you. Um, so I'm going to read a bit of the beginning of some books. And if you're interested in hearing more, we can continue. But I'd like to give you a little variety too. So if you're interested, maybe you want to pick up the book and read it yourself. We can do a little read along in here with my Kindle. So I'm going to share that on the screen and you can follow along with me. This is a book called Gone by Michael Grant. It's a great book because the action starts right off the bat. You don't have to wait around. It's just interesting from the beginning. You'll see that I've done some highlighting. Um, that's just because sometimes I do a read along where I have some teachers, uh, or excuse me, some students, um, read the dialogue part. So that's why you'll see that. All right. You'll notice there's a countdown in here at the beginning. Part of the fun of this book is figuring out what this is a countdown to. Chapter 1, 299 hours, 54 minutes. One minute the teacher was talking about the Civil War, and the next minute he was gone. There, gone. No poof, no flash of light, no explosion. Sam Temple was sitting in third period history class, staring blankly at the blackboard, but far away at his head. In his head, he was down at the beach, he and Quinn. Down at the beach with their boards, yelling, racing for that first plunge into cold Pacific water. For a moment, he thought he had imagined it, the teacher disappearing. For a moment, he thought he'd slipped into a daydream. Sam turned to Mary Terrafino, who sat just to his left. You saw that, right? Mary was staring hard at the place where the teacher had been. Um, where's Mr. Trellick? It was Quinn Gaither, Sam's best, maybe only friend. Quinn sat right behind Sam. The two of them favored window seats because sometimes if you caught the right angle, you could actually see a tiny sliver of sparkling water between the school buildings and the homes beyond. He must have left, Mary said, not sounding like she believed him. Egilio, the new kid Sam found potentially interesting, said, no man, goof. He did a thing with his fingers that was a pretty good illustration of the concept. Kids were staring at one another, craning their necks this way and that, giggling nervously. No one was scared. No one was crying. The whole, seemed, the whole thing seemed kind of funny. Mr. Trelight poofed, said Quinn, with a suppressed giggle in his voice. Hey, someone said. Where's Josh? Ted's turned to look. Yes, he was here. He was right here next to me. Sam recognized the voice. Bet. Bouncing bet. He just, you know, disappeared, Bet said. Just like Mr. Trellick. The door to the hallway opened. Every eye locked on it. Mr. Trellick was going to step in, maybe with Josh, and explain how he had pulled off this magic trick. And then, Get back to talking in his excited, strange voice about the Civil War nobody cared about. But it wasn't Mr. Trentlick. It was Astrid Ellison, known as Astrid the Genius, because she was, well, she was a genius. Astrid was in all the AP classes the school had. In some subjects, she was taking online courses from the university. Astrid had shoulder-length blonde hair and liked to wear starched white short sleeve blouses that never failed to catch Sam's eye. Astrid was out of his league, Sam knew that. There was no law against thinking about her. Who's your teacher? Astrid said. It was a collective shrug. He goofed, Quinn said. Like maybe it was funny. Isn't he out in the hallway? Mary asked. Astrid shook her head. Something weird is happening. My math study group? There were just three of us, plus the teacher. And they all just disappeared. What? Sam said. Astrid looked right at him. He couldn't look away like he normally would because her gaze wasn't challenging, skeptical like it usually was. It was just scared. Her normally sharp, discerning blue eyes were wide with way too much white shine. They're gone. They all just disappeared. What about your teacher? Adelio said. She's gone too, Astrid said. Gone? Poof, Quinn said, not giggling so much now. Starting to think maybe it wasn't a joke after all. Sam noticed a sound. More than one, really. 
distant car alarms coming from town. He stood up feeling self-conscious, like it wasn't really his place to do so, and walked on stiff legs to the door. Astrid moved away so he could step past her. He could smell her shampoo as he went by. Sam looked left, down toward room 211, the room where Astrid's math walks met. The next door down, 213, a kid stuck out his head. He had a half-scared, half-giddy expression, like someone buckling into a roller coaster. The other direction, down 207, kids were laughing too loud, freaky loud, fifth graders. Across the hall, room 208, three sixth graders suddenly burst out into the hallway. They stared at Sam like he might yell at them. Bonito Beach School was a small town school with everyone from kindergarten to ninth grade all in one building, elementary and middle school together. High school was an hour's drive away in San Luis. Sam walked toward Astrid's classroom. She and Quinn were right behind him. The classroom was empty, desk chairs, the teacher's chair all empty. Math books lay open on three of the desks, notebooks too. The computers, a row of six age maps, all showing flickering blank screens. On the chalkboard, you could quite clearly, quite clearly see pollen. She was writing the word polynomial, Astrid said in a church voice whisper. Yeah, I was gonna guess that, Sam said dryly. I had a polynomial once, Quinn said. My doctor removed it. Astrid ignored the weak attempt at humor. She disappeared in the middle of writing the O. I was looking right at her. Sam made a slight motion, pointing. A piece of chalk lay on the floor, right where it would have fallen if someone were writing the word polynomial, whatever that meant, and had disappeared before rounding off the O. This is not normal, Quinn said. Quinn was taller than Sam, stronger than Sam, at least as good a servant. But Quinn, with his half-crazy smile and tendency to dress in what could only be called a costume, today it was baggy shorts, army surplus desert boots, a pink golf shirt, and a gray fedora he found in his grandfather's attic. Put out a weird guy by the alienated sound that scared others. Quinn was his own clique, which was maybe why he and Sam Sam Temple kept a lower profile. He stuck to jeans and understated t-shirts, nothing that drew attention to himself. He had spent most of his life in Toledo Beach, attending this school, and everybody knew who he was, but few people were quite sure what he was. He wasn't a surfer, excuse me, he was a surfer who didn't hang out with surfers. He was bright, but not a brain. He was good looking, but not so that girls thought of him as a hottie. The one thing most kids knew about Sam Temple was that he was school bus Sam. He'd earned the nickname when he was in seventh grade. The class had been on the way to a field trip when the bus driver had suffered a heart attack. They'd been driving down Highway 1. Sam had pulled the man out of his seat, steered the bus home to the shoulder of the road, brought it safely to a stop, and calmly dialed 911 on the driver's cell phone. If he had hesitated for even one second, the bus would have plunged off the cliff into the ocean. His picture had been in the paper. The other two kids, plus the teacher, are gone. All except Astrid, Sam said. That's definitely not normal. He tried not to trip over her name when he said it, but failed. She had that effect on him. Yeah, kind of quiet in here, bro, Quinn said. Okay, well, I'm ready to wake up now. For once, Quinn was not kidding. Someone screamed. The three of them stumbled into the hall, which was now full of kids. A sixth grader named Becca was the one screaming. She was holding her cell phone. There's no answer. There's no answer, she cried. There's nothing. For two seconds, everyone froze. Then a rustle and a clatter, followed by the sound of dozens of fingers punching dozens of keypads. It's not doing anything. My mom would be home. She would answer. It, it's not even ringing. Oh my God, there's no internet either. I, I have a signal, but there's nothing. I have three bars. Me too, but it's not there. Someone started wailing, a creepy flesh crawly sound. Everybody talked at once, the chatter escalating to yelling. Try 911, a scared voice demanded. Who do you think I called, numb nuts? There's no 911? There's nothing. I've gone through half of my speed dials and there's not anything. 
The hall was as full of kids as it would have been during a class change, but people weren't rushing to their next class, or playing around, or spitting the box in their lockers. There was no direction. People just stood there, like a herd of cattle waiting to stampede. The alarm bell rang, as loud as an explosion. People flinched like they'd never heard it before. Well, what do we do? More than one voice asked. There must be someone in the office, the voice cried out. The bell went off. It's on a timer, moron. This from Howard. Howard was a little worm, but he was Orc's number one toady. An Orc was a glowering thug of an eighth grader, a mountain of fat and muscle who scared even ninth graders. No one called Howard out. Any insult to Howard was an attack on the Orc. They have a TV in the teacher's lounge, Astrid said. Sam and Astrid, with Quinn racing after them, pelted toward the lounge. They flew down the stairs, down to the bottom floor, where there were even fewer classrooms, fewer kids. Sam's hand on the door of the teacher's lounge. They froze. We're not supposed to go in there, Astrid said. You care, Quinn said. Sam pushed the door open. The teachers had a refrigerator. It was open. A carton of Dan and blueberry yogurt was on the floor. Gooey contents spilled onto the ready carpet. The TV was on with no picture, just static. Sam searched for the remote. Where was the remote? Quinn found it. He started running through the channels. Nothing, and nothing, and nothing. Cable's out, Sam said, aware it was kind of a stupid thing to say. Astrid reached behind the set and unscrewed the coaxial cable. The screen flickered, and the quality of the static changed a little. But as Quinn ran the channels, there was still nothing, and nothing, and nothing. We can always get channel nine, Quinn said, even without cable. Astrid said, teachers, some of the kids, cable, broadcast, cell phones, all gone at the same time. She frowned, trying to work it out. Sam and Quinn waited like she might have an answer, like she might say, oh, sure, now I understand. She was Astrid's genius, after all. But all she said was, it doesn't make any sense. Sam lifted the receiver on the wall phone, a landline. No dial tone. Was there a radio in here? There wasn't. The door slammed open, and in rushed two kids, fifth grade boys, their faces wild, excited. We own the school, one yelled. And the other one gave an answer in heat. We're going to bust open the candy machine, the first one announced. Maybe not a good idea, Sam said. You can't tell us what to do. Belligerent, but not sure of himself. Not sure he was right. You're right, little dude. But look, how about we all try to keep it together till we figure out what's going on, Sam said. You keep it together, the kid yelled. The other one hooted again. Off they went. I guess it would be wrong to ask them to bring me a Twix, Sam muttered. Fifteen. Astrid said. No, man, they were like 10, Quinn said. Not them. The kids in my class, Jink and Michael, they were both math whizzes, better than me, but they had LDs, learning disabilities, dyslexia, that kept them back. They were both a little older. I was the only 14-year-old. I think maybe Josh was 15 in our class, Sam said. So? So he was 15, Quinn. He just disappeared. Blink and he was gone. No way, Quinn said, shaking his head. Every adult and older kid in the whole school just disappears. That makes no sense. It's not just the school, Astrid said. What? Quinn snapped at her. The phones and the TV, Astrid said. No, 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 Quinn said. He was shaking his head, half smiling, like he'd been told a bad joke. My mom, Sam said. Man, stop this, Quinn said. All right? It's not funny. For the first time, Sam felt the edge of panic, like a tingling at the base of his spine. His heart was thumping in his chest, laboring as if he'd been running. Sam swallowed hard. He sucked at the air, unable to take more than shallow breaths. He looked at his friend's face. He'd never seen Quinn so scared. Quinn's eyes were behind shades, but his mouth quivered and a pink stain was creeping up his neck. Astrid was still calm, though, frowning, concentrating, trying to make sense of it all. 
We have to check it out, Sam said. Quinn let loose a sort of sobbing breath. He was already moving, turning away. Sam grabbed his shoulder. Get off me, bro, Quinn snapped. I have to go home. We have to see. We all have to go and see, Sam said. Let's go together. Quinn started to pull away, but Sam tightened his grip. Quinn, together. Come on, man, it's like a wipeout, you know? You get launched, what do you do? You try not to get worked up, Quinn muttered. That's right. You keep your head straight through the spin cycle, right? And you swing toward daylight. A surfing metaphor? Asked it asked. Quinn stopped resisting. He let go of a shuddering breath. Okay, yeah, you're right. Together. But my house first. This is messed up. This is so messed up. Astrid? Sam asked. Not sure of her. Not sure at all if she wanted to go with him and Quinn. It felt presumptuous to ask her and wrong not to ask. She looked at Sam. Looked like she was hoping to find something in his space. Sam suddenly realized that Astrid the genius didn't know what to do or where to go any better than they did. That seemed impossible. From the hallway, they heard a rising cacophony of voices, loud, scared, some babbling, as if it would be okay as long as they didn't stop talking. Some voices were just wild. It wasn't a good sound. It was frightening all by itself, that sound. Come with us, Astrid, okay? Sam said. We'll be safer together. Astrid flinched at the word safer, but she nodded. This school was dangerous now. Scared people did scary things sometimes, even kids. Sam knew that from personal experience. Fear could be dangerous. Fear could get people hurt. And there was nothing but fear running crazy through the school. Life in Perdillo Beach had changed. Something big and terrible had happened. Sam hoped he was not the cause. I really love the beginning of this book because it starts off right away with the inciting incident with the queen that says, oh my god, all these people have disappeared, what's going on? And then it leaves you with that little cliffhanger at the end of the chapter, uh, which says, Sam hoped he was not the cause right here. So now we start to think, why would Sam think he was the cause of this? What had he done? This is a great book series, by the way. There are six or seven books in the whole series, and each book is really thick. So if you're someone who likes to really get into a story, and even though the book looks really thick, you need to be so into it, you'll read straight through it. Highly recommend this book series. If you want to see more sometime, uh, maybe we can do more reviews with this one. So let me know what you think.